Hey, you probably clicked this video because you are new in the Forex game and you're looking for some solid information to get you started. If you're brand new and you're like, what do I do? Where do I start? This video is for you. I created this video because five years ago when I first started learning how to trade, um, there was very little information, comprehensive information, I should say. I had to piecemeal things together in order to make sense of it. And I was a paying member of an organization um, that did not give me the depth of knowledge that I was looking for to get started in this industry. By the time you finish this video, you will have a solid understanding of what Forex is, who the players are in the market, how the market moves. Um, you'll also have an understanding of the lingo and the language. And then finally, a good grasp on technical and fundamental analysis. So. I encourage you watch the video all the way to the end. I have sectioned it off so that if you do know something already, you don't necessarily have to watch that section. But if you're new, you need all the information, okay? You need it all. My name is Casey Jackson, and I am a registered commodity trading advisor with the National Futures Association. I started trading a little over five years ago and by day i work in economic development and real estate development and then i love love absolutely love that job love my industry um, but i have fallen in love with trading and so i started my channel i want to say about three years ago or almost three years ago uh, to create a space where people could come and they could see a comprehensive approach to the market uh, and get some good education so this video i should have done it a long time ago i didn't i waited till almost three years but it is a starter course right and you're probably like why are you doing this free like people sell this information well i'm doing it free one because um i know when i got started i didn't have a whole lot of money to begin with and then two because someone took the time to invest in me and share with me the knowledge that they had and so i am paying it forward i guess you could say okay so that is why i'm doing it free um and i hope that you get something from it if you're looking for a channel where you can get consistent uh good information you want to make sure that you consider to subscribe um and then if you like this video you get all the way to the end and you're like okay i like what she's talking what do i do now you want to make sure you click the link in the video description for my free mini course that'll get you on to the next steps okay and then if you know somebody who wants to get started trading make sure that you send them this video and if you find anything helpful in here give it a thumbs up all right so i'm not going to hold you up any longer i'm gonna let you go ahead and get started all right let's get started let's get started now i don't know how you're gonna do this um if you're on a computer if you're trying to take notes on the computer but my recommendation is that you grab a pen and you grab a paper so that you could take it old school and you could take some notes for this good information that you're about to get about forex uh, i want to make sure that you're focused so turn your phone on silent you know your friends your family ray ray and them can wait <laughs> they can wait till you finish um, and then lastly, just focus and make sure that you're taking notes. This video will be here, so you can always come back to it and refer to it um, as needed, okay? So I just want to go into, I'm just gonna assume that if you're watching this video, you don't have a whole lot of experience uh, with Forex. And so we're gonna start at the very beginning to make sure that we're all on the same page. So Forex is the buying and the selling of global currency. And so when we trade Forex, we're doing that, buying and selling currency across the world, but it's being done simultaneously. And so a lot of people explain it like if you were to go out of town and um, you trade your home currency for whatever that country's currency is, uh, then you, you, you do an exchange. That's essentially what's happening when you're trading Forex, except it's done electronically. You're dealing with a broker who handles all that back end stuff and you're able to do it from a mobile device, a laptop or a computer. Um, and so it makes it really convenient and really accessible for anyone who wants to trade. Now, there are more than just us retail traders in the game. You know, there are banks who trade foreign currency. There are producers and business owners who trade foreign currencies. And you're probably like, what do you mean producer? So somebody who makes jewelry might very well trade gold 
in order to mitigate the potential loss of the price of gold going up. You know, they may trade the market in order to make a profit to offset that cost increasing so that when they get ready to sell it, they'll make what they make from the sale and then they'll recoup whatever that difference is if that price has gone up. Um, And so you'll see that uh, in several different instances uh, in commodities and things like that. So again, there's more than just, you know, little old me and you trading the Forex market. There are far bigger institutions um, with specific reasons as to why they participate. Now, I get this question a lot. How long is the Forex market open? And one of the main things that attracted me to this market was the fact that I could create a schedule that worked for me. So when I started, I was in grad school and I was working full time. So a lot of times I would get home at 9, 10 o'clock, whatever it was. And because this market is open 24 hours a day for five days a week, it allowed me the flexibility to be able to create a schedule that worked for me. And so if you can't figure it out, like when it works for you to trade in this market, I I hate to be a pessimist, but it's like, you are probably not gonna figure out much of anything. Uh, But that's one of the things that I love about this market. Now that I mentioned, that's one of the things, but there are several things (laughs) that I actually love. Um, and there's five main reasons that people trade the Forex market. And the first one is going to be liquidity. Like you can easily get in and out of the market without a whole lot of hassle, without a whole lot of hoopla and headache. Right. And then two is the accessibility. And so, as I mentioned, as long as you have a computer, as long as you have a laptop, as long as you have a phone connected to the MT4, you should be able to trade the market. We just talked about the flexibility having the ability to be able to go in and trade in the market at whatever time you see fit during the weekend that works for your lifestyle um, makes it super attractive. When we talk like stocks and stuff like that, there's a set time that you have to be in and out. And for many of us, we work in regular jobs. So to be able to go in you know, and trade while you at work, your boss probably not gonna like that. (laughs) So um, just the flexibility is amazing. And then the opportunity, right? So once you get a good hold of this information and you understand it fully um, and you are able to practice and to implement and you find something that works for you, the opportunity is endless. There is no one who can dictate how much you can earn. I like to think of this as you having the ability to print your own money. Now, of course, there's a maturation process. um, And I wouldn't tell you that you're going to be able to go do this tomorrow because you're not. Um, But if you just keep in mind the end goal as you go through this journey and learning, like you're going to be able to do some really, really good things. Okay. And then finally, is the leverage. So leverage creates a low barrier of entry so that virtually anybody who wants to trade can trade. And we'll go into detail about what that means um, a little bit further in the presentation, but I mean, you could take $50 and start to grow it and compound it. And this is why you see a lot of people on the internet who's like, I took $300 and I flipped it to 10 grand, you know, but the goal of it is to be able to continue to grow it over time you know, so that um, you don't lose it all. So leverage is a good thing and it's a bad thing (laughs) if you don't know how to use it and what you're doing. But these are the reasons that the Forex market is attractive to so many people and why they choose to trade it. So the other question, now you don't tell me about leverage, you don't tell me about opportunity. How do I actually make money? What do I have to do? What are the steps? And so you see, I got a little chart on the screen because essentially, you, you're trading, you got to learn and you got to understand the charts. You know, you got to understand a little bit about fundamentals, how the market moves, all of that good stuff. But this is how you make the money. OK. Drilling down just a little bit further, we make money through pips and pips stand for percentage in point. And so what it does, a pip basically is the smallest unit of measurement in the Forex market. And what it does is it allows, or I shouldn't say allow, um, it measures the price differential between two currencies that create a currency pair. And so you're trading 
that movement and that difference and um, depending on your lot size which we'll talk about uh, that dictates how much money you'll make and predicts like what you're earning so I want to go over an example here now let's just say this is euro USD and so we're counting pips basically right and so you'll see that for euro USD and pretty much every other currency except JPY so pairs that end in JPY and then also gold and silver you got to multiply by four decimal points in order to get how many pips you earn so let's say you see at the top it says sell you sold euro USD at a dollar right and so it says buy because buy is what happens on the back end to close your sale trade out and so uh, you made 100 pips. Now I know 0. 0.0100 does not look like 100, but how we get to 100 is you multiply that by 10,000 and that gets you to your 100 pips, okay? And so there are different lot sizes. You heard me say lot size. Now, when I first started learning how to trade, I didn't have nobody tell me what lot size was. I went through trial and error, logged into MT4 and played around and figured out that this is my multiplier, right? So if I catch 100 pips, and I'm trading at a dollar, that's a hundred dollars, right? So you'll see that there are different lot sizes that you could trade. You have a micro lot and it's listed as 0 0.01. That's not really a penny, it's 10 cents. So one pip in this situation, if you were trading 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, it would be 10 cent increments. So 0 0.02 would be 20 cents, 0 0.03 would be 30 cents. So one pip at 0 0.01, is a thousand units of the currency and it's 10 cents per pip. A mini lot is a little bit more. It's a dollar, right? But it's listed as 0 0.1. So one pip is $1 and that's 10,000 units. And then you got the big daddy, the standard lot. And that's going to be listed as 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. And that's equal to $10 a pip. And I know it might sound exciting like, ooh, I'm going to start off at $10 a pip or $20 a pip. You don't want to do that. So slow your roll. <laughs> you want to make sure that you are managing risk appropriately so that you don't bust your account wide open. But the standard is a thousand units of the currency, right? Okay. So let's just say you get into this. You find a system that works for you. You find two pairs that you really like and you're able to consistently average 50 pips on each pair so that's 100 pips a week so we're not talking anything major we're not talking anything crazy but what that does for you based on those lot sizes that we discussed if you consistently did that and you were trading a micro lot that would be ten dollars that you would earn so ten dollars a week at you know, you just going in, what, spending an hour or two maybe on a Saturday finding those setups, that's pretty good money because it's going to compound, right? But what's even better is if you're able to grow your account and you're able to trade a mini lot where that's a dollar per pip. Those same 100 pips, it's now $100 because of your lot size. Now, let's say you really get a hold of this, you master it, and you're trading $10 a pip. That 100 100 pips is now worth a thousand dollars and so it goes on and on and on just imagine if you were able to get to a point where your account can support you trading twenty dollars a pip all you find a week is a hundred pips that's two grand a week that's pretty major right so this is what i mean when i say the opportunity is limitless for you but you just got to go about the right way in doing it so now I want to touch on, we talked about the five reasons why people like Forex, but what we're going to talk about in this section is going to be the leverage, okay? Leverage is why people can flip these accounts and grow them super fast, but leverage will also have you crying when you bust your $8,000 account like I did when I first got started, <laughs> okay? So um, the brokers that you work with, they're going to require you to have uh, a margin account and a margin uh, account is basically uh, the amount of money that the broker wants you to have in the account in order to control a position. So the reason that you use margin is it provides you with the ability to have leverage. So let's do a deeper dive into leverage and how that works. But before we get there, I'm just going to break down this margin. So if the broker requires that you have 2% margin in your account and um, 
you want to have access to $100,000 in capital to trade, that means that you have to deposit $2,000. Now, that sounds like a pretty sweet deal to me. You deposit $2,000 and I'll let you trade like you have uh, 100000 Like that's pretty huge, okay? Pretty, pretty huge. So let's go back to the leverage piece and how it fits in with the margin. And so leverage is basically um, money that you borrow from your broker once you make that margin deposit that they allow you to trade. So again, traders like Forex because of the higher leverage that it allows you uh, in order to make money. And so you don't have to deposit a whole lot of money in order to see uh, a bigger result. So like in the stock market, in order to really see some gains, you got to be working with a pretty sizable account, which is not the situation in Forex. Okay. And so let's break this down even further. When you find your broker, you're going to have the option to choose from different amounts of leverage. Now I've seen leverage as low as 10 to one. And I've seen it as high as 2000 to one. And so what that means basically is let's say you choose 50. That means for every dollar that you put in the account, the broker is going to give you access to $50. They're going to treat it like it's $50 for every $1. Let me backtrack. Say that again. For every dollar that you put in your account, the broker is going to treat it like it's $50. So let's look at this even further. Let's say in your brokerage account, on your 50 to one leverage, you put in $250, okay? You put in 250 bucks and the broker's gonna give you trading power of $12,500. And the way that I arrived at that is I took the 250 and I multiplied it by the amount of leverage. So if this was 100 to one, that means you take the 250 times 100, you have access to trade capital of like 25,000. So this is why people like Forex. Now, you're like, okay, I learned about pips. (laughs) I understand what it is. It's the measurement of movement in the market and how we make money. But now how do I get these pips? (laughs) And basically what you're going to be doing is you're going to be looking for buying and selling opportunities. And so you'll hear as you continue to study this, you'll hear people call buying, oh, I'm going long or I'm bullish on, you know, X pair. Or you'll hear selling, I'm going short, or I'm bearish on this pair. And so when you hear those terms, they'll probably be used interchangeably. But this is what we look for when we either do a technical or fundamental analysis in order to determine where I need to get in to buy. Where do I need to get in to sell in order to catch these pips to make this money? Now, I just mentioned it before that there are two different ways you can do and excuse me, an analysis, but actually I think they kind of work in conjunction with each other. I don't think that one is more superior than the other. Instead, I think that they are influenced. So I think the technicals are influenced by the fundamental. And so technical, meaning you're using tools to look at a chart in order to figure out what's going on in the market, right? So you're evaluating patterns and historical trends and price action in order to determine your hypothesis. Now with a fundamental analysis, you are looking at um, a country's economy or their currency, the value of their currency based on underlying economic factors. And so you'll see people say, don't trade the news. Like what news? (laughs) Well, there are economic reports that come out every single month that's related to a country's gross domestic product, inflation, interest rates, and then you have monetary policy that happens or political or social events that influences how that currency moves and the value of that currency. I guess that's a better way to say it. It influences the value of the currency. So you'll see that some people heavily, heavily rely on fundamentals. And then you have some people who don't even pay attention to them and trade just the technicals. I think that there is a healthy balance between the two in order to, um, you know, have a little bit of edge in the market. Now that you have an understanding of what a currency pair is and how it's put together, you know, we briefly talked about fundamentals and how they influence the value of a currency. So I just want to make sure that you understand in what way the currency pair is impacted depending on the value of the currency. So I'm using Euro USD again as the pair, but this goes for pretty much any pair. When your base is strong 
and your quote is weak, that presents potential buy opportunities. Let me say it again. When your base, so your base in this instance is the euro, the quote is the U.S. dollar. And so when the base is, is, is strong and the quote is weak, you're going to be looking for buy setup. So a lot of people often are like, okay, so I have this news, but I really don't understand how to tie it back into my analysis. So if you start paying attention to what's going on with monetary policy, with the interest rates, with inflation, with gross domestic product numbers that come out, and you start to understand a country's currency and its value, you can say, okay, well, numbers were a little weak and it, it devalued the currency. And so for a US dollar, I know that I'm gonna be looking for buy setups. That is how uh, news influences the value of the currency and how you relate it back to your technical. Now the inverse is same currency pair, different values, right? So you got a weak base and a strong quote that presents potential sale opportunities. So it doesn't matter if that said USD JPY, it doesn't matter if it said GBP JPY, or if it said GBP odd. If GBP is weak and odd is strong, I'm gonna be looking for sales. So you wanna make sure that you capture this slide because this is important. Um, this is very important. And so you wanna commit it to memory so that when you see that news, you can automatically say, oh, okay, well, I know I'm looking for sales. I know I'm looking for buys because of X, Y, Z. Now, in order to successfully analyze what's going on in the market, you have to have a basic understanding um, of how to mark up a Forex chart. If you peruse through this channel, there are videos on top of videos on top of videos of me walking you through that process. If you're looking for something a little bit more detailed, then you can definitely go to www.theprofitplay.co forward slash 400 pips. And there is a mini course that will take you through it. It's no cost. Um, but I like Smart Trader, and that's because I am a FIB based trader. And there's some proprietary uh, tools within Smart Trader that allows me to. Um, automate the process and make it faster and easier to go through and mark up the charts that I mark up. And then there is smart uh, trading view. <laughs> trading view is not bad. This is where I started and I actually really like uh, trading view. Um, it just requires more work. As I developed as a trader, I understood what made sense for me and my approach to the market and that was Fibonacci. And I didn't want to spend all day at the charts. And unfortunately, Trading view does not have that same um, internal automation that Smart Trader does. And so um, that's why I'm with Smart Trader. But Trading View is a phenomenal platform. Again, that's where I got started. It'll allow you also to get in some practice of learning how to draw the Fibonacci and learning some technical analysis. Um, but I, I like them both. Uh, I think they both could be useful. Now, if you're going to look at fundamentals, uh, there are a couple websites that I use and swear by, I guess you could say, and that's going to be tradingeconomics.com. That's basically giving you the summary of a specific political event or um, monetary policy event, like the rising of rates or how the market is responding, what people are anticipating. Um, that gives you more commentary. And then Forex Factory uh, is structured in a way that gives you um, information as far as how volatile uh, price is anticipated to be based on whatever news is coming out. So it not only gives you a calendar of events, it tells you, hey, you want to be careful in the market today because this news is coming out. This is how price typically reacts to this sort of news based on the results. So these are the two websites that I would recommend uh, for you to start understanding that fundamental analysis. Now that you understand the makeup of a currency pair a little bit better, I want to deep dive into counting pips, okay, and breaking this down for you. So when you see the number, you really understand what's happening. So you'll see I got Euro USD up here again, and let's say the exchange rate is at a dollar. So what's out to the left of the decimal point 
is dollars. What two places after is cents. And then those last two is what we call the pips, the price interest point. And so looking at this even further, let's break it down just a little bit more, right? So immediately following, I feel like I'm going back to like what, third grade, <laughs> breaking this down. <laughs> um, but uh, immediately following the decimal point is a tenths place. Following the tenths is the hundreds. And then the pips is represented in the thousands and the 10,000s. So when before we multiplied by 10,000, it was for the reason that the currency pair we were trading had that many places after it. So that's what we needed to do in order to get to the number of pips. Now, I mentioned before that JPY pairs are a little bit different, right? JPY pairs don't have four decimal places. They have two. And so it measures, you'll see the pip at is going to be the thousandths. So that's the very smallest version of a pip. But what you're looking at when you're looking at JPY pairs is going to be the tenths and the hundredths place. All right, so we went over Euro USD and I kind of fast tracked you into that. But going over the major currencies that are traded, you're going to see the Australian dollar, you have the Canadian dollar, you have the Swiss franc, the Euro, the Great British Pound, the Japanese yen, the New Zealand dollar, and the US dollar. And so I would encourage you to familiarize yourself with the short firm, excuse me, the short firm. I can't talk. <laughs> familiarize yourself with the short form or the abbreviation of the currency pair because that's what you're going to be looking at when you're in MetaTrader 4 or you're on one of the charting platforms and you're trying to look at a currency. So when I say the short form, I mean like for Australian dollar, it's AUD. For a Canadian dollar, CAD right? So you want to get familiar with that. Now, this is just the individual currencies. When we put them together, you got the major currency pairs, right? So you have all USD. So you're trading the Australian dollar against the US dollar, Euro against the US dollar, GBP against the US dollar, USD CAD, USD Swiss, so CHF, USD JPY, and the New Zealand dollar against the US dollar. So in the major currency pairs, there should be one thing that is common that you recognize. Type it in the comments below. What do you see in all of these currency pairs that make it um, the same or related? Okay, I've given you enough time. <laughs> they all got the US dollar in them. So it makes it the major currency pair, okay? So the US dollar influences a lot that goes on in this market. All right. So then you have minor currency pairs and the minor currency pairs don't have the U.S. dollar in them. It's usually, um, you know, uh, different countries matched up. So you got the euro versus the great British pound, the euro versus the Canadian dollar, the euro versus the Australian dollar, the euro versus the New Zealand dollar, the euro versus the Swiss franc, the euro versus the Japanese yen, the pound versus the yen, Australian dollar versus the yen, New Zealand dollar versus the yen. And then the Canadian dollar versus the yen. Then you got the Swiss franc versus the yen. The Great British pound versus the Canadian dollar. The pound versus the Australian dollar. Um, the Australian dollar versus the New Zealand dollar. And the Australian dollar versus the Canadian dollar. Australian dollar versus the Swiss franc. New Zealand dollar versus the Swiss franc. The Canadian dollar. Bleh. <laughs> the Canadian dollar versus the Swiss franc and then the New Zealand dollar versus the Canadian dollar. So I know this seems like a lot. Please do not feel overwhelmed. Um, I will advise you that once you get good at marking up charts and understanding the fundamentals, like these can work together for you to maximize the earning potential that you have. Don't focus on that right now. Just focus on understanding how they're constructed, what's major, what's minor, and um, get that first. But don't be intimidated. I promise you it's really not that deep. <laughs> it's not. It's a lot of information, but I know you got it. Okay. Then you have exotic currency pairs and then commodities. And so um, these are the exotics are uh, pairs that aren't traded as often. And then they have like really volatile movements. Um, so I stay away from them. 
there are some brokers who don't even have these that they trade and then there's some that do sometimes the spread is like really major on them because they're less liquid than those majors and those minors um, but I did just want to show those to you and then I talked about the commodities and so XAU USD is gold versus the United States dollar and then you have silver which is then you have silver then you have silver which is XAG USD and then you have oil oil is another one that I stay away from as far as actually trading it but it is a good indicator um, as it relates to the Canadian dollar um, and so it can give you some insight fundamentally on what you're looking at uh, for those Canadian dollar pairs. Now, when should you be trading? This is one of the questions that I get a lot, and I really think it depends on what style of trader you are. So you got to spend a little bit of time to figure out what that is. And so we'll go over it, though. A scalper, that's somebody who's in and out of the market relatively quick. And so they trade like the five minute, they trade the 15, the 30, and they're in, they're out. Those style of traders take a little bit higher risk in order um, to make profit in the market. That may work for you. Then you have intraday traders and the intraday trader falls somewhere between a scalper and a swing trader. So their trades may take a couple hours to play out. It may even take a day. I think you still can consider that intraday. Um, and so then you have swing traders like me. And that means that I'm taking setups that can take days, that can take weeks or even months to play out. So you really got to spend some time and figure out what works for you and what can you be consistent with? What can you maintain? And you trade according to that. And I mentioned before that I think a lot of people get hung up on what they want to be versus what they really are, what they got going on in their life and what they can consistently do. So spend a little time and figure that part out, okay? So now there are three peak sessions for trading, right? There's the Tokyo session, or you probably hear it called Asian session, and that's from 7 p.m. to 4 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's Tokyo. Then you have the London session. That's from 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you're in Pacific or um, Central, you want to just, you know, adjust based on what you see Eastern Standard. And then there's the New York session. That's 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Now, you don't have a specific time that you should be trading. I personally think that if you do your analysis and you get to a point where you can find a potential setup and, um, you can set the trade up, then set it up. You know, I trade when there's a setup. I don't limit myself to just a time, but I am a swing trader and everybody's not going to be a swing trader. So I have on here that, you know, what a scalper is going to look for is volatility in the market. And the, the time frames that that will happen is most likely during London session and New York session, right? A swing trader, I'm trading whenever I see something. <laughs> I'm executing. And so again, I don't limit myself to a specific time um, that I have to be on the charts. What I do do though, is I sit down every single week and I go through and I mark up my charts. Let's talk about these brokers. I get at least three to five questions a week about if I have recommendations for brokers. And I would suggest that you do your own homework to figure out what broker you want to work with. But I will give you um, some information that will be helpful in figuring out what makes sense for you. Now, there are two different types of brokers. You can have a regulated broker or you can have an unregulated broker. And just probably what you're thinking is correct. A regulated broker is a firm that is licensed um, by some sort of government authority in order to offer services, trading services to clients. So in the United States, that's going to be the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, better known as the CFTC. And for different countries, um, they have something equivalent uh, of what's considered a regulated broker. 
right? So with a regulated broker, let me go back. With a regulated broker, um, your leverage is going to be lower than with an unregulated broker. Um, how you withdraw, how you deposit is different. Um, the commissions and the spreads are probably going to be a little bit different too. Um, and if you experience something with fraud or loss or something like that, you have an entity that you can go to, you can file a complaint and they can investigate the matter for you with an unregulated broker. You don't have that capability, right? So there's no licensing. There's no one that the company has to answer to. Um, they don't have the same rules in place that a regulated broker does. So it's a little bit more risky as far as you to participate with an unregulated broker, but it gives you more flexibility. So when I talked about that higher leverage, that 2001, now I would hope that that's not standard practice, uh, <laughs> that 2001, but you know, um, some people, when you get to that level, it might make sense for you to do that. I don't know. I'm not judging you, but um, you can choose, you know, whatever you want to choose. So I've just got a couple different companies on here um, that I have dealt with uh, in some capacity, uh, all except maybe one or two. I take that back. And so you have like TD Ameritrade in the U.S. That's really huge. Everybody knows who they are. They are under a regulated authority. So they have to follow those rules. And um, then you have KOT 4X, which does um, indices. I think they do crypto and foreign exchange currency. Um, and then you have Oanda, which is regulated, Forex.com, Interactive Brokers, and IC Markets. Uh, back in 2020, when the pandemic happened, a lot of the unregulated brokers stopped accepting U.S. clients. And so the clients that were a part of the company or had an account prior to, uh, you know, when things went crazy, you still have your account. So I have an account with a regulated broker and I have some accounts with an unregulated broker and I've had no issues thus far, but you want to make sure that you do your due diligence in order to figure out who you personally want to do business with. For me, it was making sure that I had direct access to customer service, that I got a prompt and timely response. I looked at the spreads and then the types of instruments that I trade. I don't trade indices and I don't trade crypto. So it made the choice very easy for me. Okay. Now, I do want to say this because um, people have asked, like, why are they asking me for this information? It's basically know your customers. So most brokers are going to require that you submit some information to them in order to open up your account. And it's going to be documents that you're probably like, why do they want to see my utility bill? Why do they need my home address? Why do they need my ID? Well, they need it because they're probably <laughs> regulated by some entity that requires that they get this information. And so this is called, again, know your customer. So they may ask for ID or a passport, utility bill, something that has your home address on it. They'll want your phone number and then your trading experience and any other financial information that's relevant to uh, you opening that account. OK, so let's talk about market uh, order types, right? So I mentioned before that as a swing trader, I kind of just mark up my charts on a weekend. And then when the market opens, I set my trades and then I go about my week. And you're probably wondering, how are you able to do that? And that's through the various types of orders that are available uh, to use in the Forex market when you trade. So you have market execution, buy and sell limits, and buy and sell stops. Now let's first, let's talk about the market execution. It's exactly what you think it is. So the minute you press the button on MT4, whether it be on your phone or on the computer, your trade is activated right then. Within seconds of you pressing that button, that means you're taking it where price is at. If you are uh, like me and let's say you decide Fibonacci is one of the tools that you're going to use in order to trade, this is where limit orders can come in handy. So... We'll start off with the buy limit. In a buy scenario, price is above your desired entry. But you know that when price travels, it has to retrace. And so you say, okay, I want to enter at this level. And so you see that price is above and you see that green solid line. I'll put my mouse over it. This green solid line, price is above where you want to enter. And you say, okay, price has to come down in order for my trade to be activated. So your desired price is below where price is currently at. That's a buy limit. So I like to think of limits as like bounces 
Um, so price has to bounce at that lower level before the trade is activated. In a sales scenario, it's just the inverse. So price is below your desired entry level. So current price is down here at the bottom and it has to travel up and bounce off of price in order for the trade to be activated and continue. So price would need to rise in order for the order to be activated. Okay, then you have stops. Stops I like to think of as like elevator. They have to go through a price level in order for it to be activated. So if you're in a scenario where you think price is going to continue to rise and you wanna buy, that means in that scenario, price is below your desired entry level. So you'll see to the left, we got the green solid line. Price hasn't quite made it to that level that you wanna buy at, but you think it's gonna still go up. So you say, okay, hey, I want you to activate me or enter me into this trade at this level. And so price would go through and you would be activated. And the sale is just the opposite. Price is above the level that you want to be entered into. And so price has to go through that level in order for the trade to be triggered and to be activated. And that's called a sale stop. All right, so you made it to the end. I know that's a lot of information, but I encourage you not to become discouraged. You will get this. Keep watching this video over as many times as you need to in order to get a good grasp. Now, as I mentioned before, if you went through this and you're like, okay, I got this, I, I got a good foundation, what do I do next? Go ahead, visit the link in the video description for the mini course and move forward. Now the key is to start implementing. It's repetition. It's practicing marking up charts over and over and over and over and over again. At some point, you're probably going to be sick of them. But in the end, you're going to love it. <laughs> you're going to love it. So if you want to learn how you can find your own key setups, uh, if you want to learn how uh, you can go in, slice up and dice up a chart and be able to know when to get in, know when to get out um, and use all of this information together to formulate your opinion click that link in the video description i appreciate you guys for watching i hope it was helpful tell me in the comments below and i will see you on the next video have a phenomenal phenomenal day